So hi, uh, this is a re-record of a talk I did uh, last week in Ottawa um, at a pre-conference workshop uh, for the International Conference of Infant Studies. And I've been looking forward to this for ages because um, it really was the first time in a room. I reckon there's five groups in the world at the moment, as far as I know, uh, that have published certainly on uh, looking at speech brain entrainment um, in um, infant and young childhood. Um, and there's a similarly small number of people who are looking at brain brain entrainment. So that's what we're doing a lot of. So it really was a unique opportunity to get pretty much everybody in the world who's looking at these questions at the moment are together in a room together. Uh, so I just did a short, you know, where are we at uh, to start us off? Uh, so why are we doing this? Uh, where are we at at the moment? So uh, so we know that uh, we spend our um, early lives um, almost entirely um, in the company of an adult caregiver. Um, uh, and we also know uh, that almost everything that we know about how the infant brain learns to process social information comes from studying it on its own uh, viewing a screen in non-interactive context. So it's this great irony. Uh, we're trying to find out about social interaction, but the only way up till now that we've been able to really study it is in non-interactive context, flashing up pictures of normally static faces um, on a screen, yeah? And this is a problem because the questions that we ask uh, in neuroscience determine that the answers that we find. So if I'm only looking at how my brain reacts when I flash a picture up um, on a screen, then that's all I'm gonna find out, yeah? even though it's not something that we ever actually experience um, in our day-to-day -day lives. We very rarely see pictures just flashing on and off out of back, back, um, back blackness. So what are the differences? So three key differences between uh, the real world um, and how we currently study uh, babies' brains. Uh, so firstly, the way that we study it is this one-way flow of information from the screen uh, to the baby. Yeah, we're showing them stuff on a screen and measuring how their brain reacts to it. Uh, and that's really not how we use our brains um, in social interaction. Adults respond uh, to what children do um, and children process information differently depending on whether it's an attentional episode that they initiated or not. So that's something really important to be thinking about. Um, and there's also this really important thing that um, the way that we do experiments at the moment is it's a predetermined sequence of events that are determined by the experimenter. And then again, in a fundamental way, uh, that's not how our brains operate. We generate experiences through interactions, through what we, what, how we act with on the world. Yeah? And thirdly, it's massively simplified. So, you know, static features, you know, really exaggerated facial expressions and really, really, really pared down, you know, non-ecological sequences of events in which, you know, for example, an actress uh, looks down at the screen, looks up at the screen for exactly 8,000 milliseconds, then looks down at one of two objects, you know, on the table in front of her for 4,000 milliseconds, which is very, very different to how we're actually using our brains in the real world. So that's why we, uh, for a few years now, funded by uh, grants from the uh, UK Research Council's uh, Level Hume Trust and European Research Council, have been doing measuring kind of dyadic brain activity uh, during free-flowing interactions. So where are we at at the moment? So we know to start with that we've got a real problem with artifact. Uh, so this is kind of muscular signatures picking up our brain recordings. Uh, we know that it can't be removed completely from any EEG recording. That if anyone tells you, you know, artifact was removed from the data, you know, when you're reviewing it, you know, I always criticize that because nobody can record artifacts uh, from EEG. With naturalistic studies, it's an additional problem though because the artifact is systematically linked to the events that you're trying to study. So you're normally time locking uh, your, your data to a moment where they look somewhere or a moment where they say something or the moment where they touch something or moments where they move. And all of these create artifact that's systematically linked to the event that you're trying to study. Okay? So given that, we know that behavior is synchronized during an interaction. Okay, so we just uh, reviewed uh, kind of, this is a review at the bottom that's looking at that. So what can studying neural synchrony add on top of this behavioral synchrony that we've been able to study for a while? Yeah. So we know that if I have two actors, actor A and actor B, and say we time lock it to all the moments where um, actor A shifts their gaze from looking to the side to looking directly at someone. Yeah. Uh, in uh, neuroscience terms, that's, that's termed the sender of an event, so the sender of a gaze cue, and then the receiver, that's the person who's being looked at, yeah? So first of all, we can look at things like actor-observer correspondences. So when I do something and when someone does it to me during an interaction, do I get similar patterns of brain activity? Um, and then we can also look at more from a turn-taking point of view. So um, we can look at actor-observer correspondences. So, or we can look at response preparation and anticipation. So those moments where the baton changes from one person to another during social interaction. Yeah? We can also look at shared entrainment to external features of the environment. Uh, so basically, we know that our, our, our brains synchronize to speech. Yeah. So if two people are listening to the same speech stream, then you would expect 
uh, that their brains are showing similar patterns of activity. Okay? For most people's definition of looking directly at brain to brain entrainment, this isn't enough. Yeah, If I've got two people um, in a separate room, um, for example, uh, watching TV at the same time and their brains are showing similar pattern of activity, is this enough for us to be measuring brain brain entrainment? A lot of people would say no. Um, but we can definitely look at other things like cognitive factors, like how shared understanding mediates shared entrainment to a common stimulus. So that is definitely something I think that's interesting uh, to be looking at. Um, some people say they want to go beyond that. So this paper uh, by Clay Hoyro just came out um, in um, TINS, Trends in Neurosciences, um, and he really explicitly in his definition of interbrain entrainment excludes any type of um, interbrain entrainment that's independent of behaviors and environmental cues. So the things that I've been talking about so far. Yeah? And we've talked about it in the lab um, quite a lot. And to me, that's just weird. You know, if we can't tell where the interbrain and in, in, entrainment is coming from, you know, is it due to shared behaviors? Is it due to shared environment? If we can't tell where it's coming from, then, you know, it makes me really worry to be looking at it. You know, this is obviously a really big chat, but, you know, that's my, that's our starting position. You know, uh, we, we're not really happy, you know, thinking about these phenomena if we can't explain where they're coming from mechanistically. Yeah. So we're definitely concentrating on uh, looking at the role of shared behaviors during an interaction and the role of shared environment. Yeah. The problem is, though, and this is what we're really at at the moment, these are very, very subtle effects that we're trying to pick up with noisy recording techniques. Yeah. So just to give you one example of that before I finish. Um, so uh, so there's this very famous uh, paper um, uh, looking at um, uh, showing that even from a couple of weeks uh, for birth, um, if you flash up pictures of a face that's either looking directly at um, a baby or looking slightly askance from a baby, and you look at how the baby's brain reacts. This paper came out um, uh, saying that um, the baby reacts differently depending on if the face is looking directly at it, yeah? Which has been the bedrock for loads and loads of really, really influential theories um, in developmental uh, kind of psychology over the years, yeah? So we try to look at this in a naturalistic real world setting. So these moments where A looks to B and we were interested in how B's brain reacts. Yeah, exactly the same as the paradigm that they were trying to simulate by flashing up pictures. Yeah. So A is the sender, uh, B is the receiver. Yeah. And in fact, when we look at it in a real world setting, we get no evidence um, in either the adult brain um, or the infant's brain that when someone looks at us during an interaction, our brain responds differently. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's a really, really important type of type of finding that's really starting to question, you know, a lot of these earlier findings. Yeah. It might simply be because our techniques aren't sensitive enough. Yeah. Or it might be that they're not there at all. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, having these types of findings, you know, thinking about this it has, has led us to step back a second and look at what actually virtually nobody really looks at in their interactions. Lots of people are comparing between conditions, uh, but nobody really looks at are we actually finding above chance brain entrainment during an interaction? So this couple of papers, uh, both with animals, um, have suggested that you do, you know, using really, really quite convincing methods. But can we detect this using our less sensitive, more noisy measures that we're using with young children? Yeah. So this is a graph that uh, my PhD student I plotted uh, very recently. This is still very much work in progress, um, suggesting that if we look at POV, so that's phase locking value during a free parent child in interaction over the course of the whole experiment. Yeah, you really, really it doesn't look like over the course of the whole experiment, we're getting big differences between our real and our shuffled data. Yeah. So there really is a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um, how do we measure entrainment? So, so there's a lot that we need to think about about how we're measuring it. Yeah, can we detect these really, really subtle cognitive influences on entrainment given the inherent noisiness of uh, the measurement techniques? Yeah, and we need to really, really set a, bit, a, a kind of bench work for the field. You know, how do we tell whether we are actually experiencing above chance brain entrainment? Yeah, this is definitely a field like lots and lots of other areas of developmental EEG and F years. It's a field where p hacking is easy. Uh, so we really, really, really need to avoid that. We really want robust, reliable, replicable findings. OK, so just to say what I've said, I talked about three key differences between the real world and the settings in which we study brains. Yeah. Um, and then um, I talked at studying neural synchrony, how I feel quite uncomfortable with the idea of studying neural synchrony, independent of being able to know where it's come from. Yeah. But I do feel comfortable studying behaviors during an interaction and shared environment. And then said, you know, these are very subtle effects and we're finding them hard to pick them up. 